Often referred to as the father of Western monasticism and the creator of the rule for monastic life, St. Benedict of Nursia's passion for developing the monastic order into a family unit helped transform the status quo of monastic life and developed a way of life still visible to this day. Stay tuned as we discuss the early life, his first introduction to monastic life, a failed first attempt at being abbot that left his followers trying to poison him, and finally, how all of this affected his creation of the rule and how he implemented it in his first Benedictine monastery. Information on St. Benedict of Nursia, sometimes spelled Norcia, is mostly found recorded in the second book of St. Gregory's Dialogues. This recording is more of a sketch of his life rather than a true biography in the modern sense and looks mostly at the miraculous incidents rather than a chronological retelling of his life. The information here can be treated as accurate, however, since Benedict's own disciples were the people who gave this information to Gregory. St. Benedict was born in 480 CE as the son of a noble in Nursia. He also had a sister, who most assumed to be his twin, named Scholastica, who would also go on to be canonized by the Catholic Church as well. Although Benedict would spend his first few years with his twin sister Scholastica, it would be in an early age that his family sent him to Rome to start his studies. His studies in Rome, however, would not last as long as his parents had planned. Benedict longed for something more than what he was getting in Rome. No longer did he want his normal routine in a big city. He wanted a way to worship and experience God that was more than what he was receiving in his studies. At this time, there were many who had taken to the wilderness in search of that exact thing. People like Antony of Egypt had made popular a way of worshiping that sought true enlightenment not in the traditional forms of study, but in the ascetic lifestyle of monasticism. This idea was intriguing to young Benedict, and although a life lived in complete isolation was not what he was searching for, a simple life outside of the great city of Rome in which he could attend to his holy purpose and follow the life taught in the Gospels was exactly what he wanted. Scholars cannot point to an exact age for many of the events in Benedict's early life, but it can be guessed that Benedict was probably around the age of 20 when he left his studies at Rome in favor of something more. Setting off, he and his nurse traveled and settled down in a town named Infa. The small town was exactly the type of place that Benedict imagined when he was looking for a small, quiet area that allowed him to answer the call that God had put on his heart. The small community would shortly be his downside though, as Gregory tells us that after performing some small miracles for the community, he became well known and even sought after from those in the community and in other areas. The last miracle that caused Benedict to second guess everything he had done came when his nursemaid had broken a piece of farming equipment. Benedict restored the farming equipment not back to how it was, but reportedly back to perfect. To escape the unwelcome notoriety that came with these miracles, he decided he had to find somewhere else to go. Leaving his nurse behind, he made his way to another local town named Subiaco. It was along this way that his life took a sharp right turn. A man by the name of Romanos of Subiaco introduced himself to Benedict. Romanos explained that he was a leader of a monastery and introduced Benedict to what is known as the monk's habit. This one relationship would lead Benedict to spend three years in the cave above the lake unknown to most men. In these three years spent mostly alone, broken up only by the occasional communication with the outside world and visit from Romanos, that he matured in both mind and character, in the knowledge of himself and fellow men, becoming not merely known but respected by others. Because of the respect that Benedict had gained over the past few years, after an abbot of a local community had passed away, he was offered the position of abbot. This opportunity would come to be much more of a burden than anyone had imagined at this time. What seemed like a great idea for the monks quickly became a nightmare. Benedict, who had spent three of the previous years alone committed to living life away from a set community, was now in charge of leading a community who had spent many years living and growing in a community all their own. But after much begging, Benedict finally accepted the role and began trying to put into practice leading this group of monks. This, however, would fail miserably. What Benedict had presumed would happen did exactly that. Benedict, who was accustomed to the very bare-bones living that came with surviving in a cave, 
started to implement rules that seemed very overbearing and strict to the monks. It is not known whether Benedict is to be blamed for creating these rules as heavy burdens on the monks, or if the monks were simply overreacting and wanted a more lax way of life. Either way, all of these issues quickly came to blow when the monks conspired to poison the drink of Benedict. After passing the poisoned cup to Benedict, everything fell apart as when he blessed the cup it shattered in his hand. Not wanting to start any more trouble or risk the end of his life again, he parted ways and returned back to his life in the cave. Yet even this did not take away his notoriety, as both his fame and miracles increased. Because of the increase, people were drawn to Benedict, and with caution, he created another community with those who had came to him for his teachings. This community consisted of 12 monasteries, with 12 monks at each, and with Benedict holding a general control over the groups as a whole. It would be in these troubling and challenging years that the great contribution from Benedict would be forged, trying to figure out the right balance between the outcast monastic life and the community of a monastery, led to the creation of what we now call the Rule of St. Benedict. It was at this time Benedict created what is known as the Rule. It is of importance to take a sidetrack away from his life and mention a few details about this writing. Not only is it the accumulation of everything Benedict had been going through, but it is also the turning point of which he lives the rest of his life. The rule is comprised of 73 short chapters that speak on the spiritual and administrative side of having a successful community in a monastery. But it is important to note here that Benedict did not originally set out to create a clerical, authoritative outline for leaders. Rather, he sought to bring balance to all who sought the life. The most important emphasis in these rules is that all who seek to be a part of the community be part for the rest of their lives. In this way, the community will come to see each other not as distinct individuals, but as a family unit living together. What exactly did this look like though? I want to highlight a few interesting parts of the rule, but I want to encourage you to follow some of the links in the description below to get a more complete understanding of the rule as a whole. Some of the interesting things to note include the day is to be broken up into three areas, eight hours of sleep, eight hours of prayer, and eight hours of work. Work, however, was not just for slaves, but work was a universal lot of all man. That work, however, was to meet whatever need is there for the community inside and outside of the church. The superior in charge was to be elected by the group and become the absolute leader of the community. Religious life is essentially social and only a small percentage have enough self-discipline to live as a true hermit. And the final thing I want to note is that private ownership is strictly forbidden, but they are to be provided with whatever is necessary and simple for the situation. The rule is meant for every class of mind and every degree of learning. It is not framed only for the educated and for souls advanced in perfection, but is centered on having some degree of goodness and a beginning of holiness. It is important to note that although the rule is linked with Benedict, it is clear that he used writings of such people like the Desert Fathers, St. Augustine, and St. John Cassian. This does not discredit what Benedict created, however. And even with the work used from the people mentioned, what was collected together and designated as the rule of St. Benedict was a unique creation that brought together the works of great Christians before him with great personal insights derived from the life of Benedict himself. But with that being said, this was more than just a theoretical insight. It would not take long to see what this role looked like in practice. Okay, back to St. Benedict and his life. Although these 12 monasteries helped Benedict create an idea for the rule, it would ultimately be jealousy that led to him putting into practice all that he had read. It was at this time a neighboring priest sent a naked woman to the courtyard of the saint's monastery in an attempt to scandalize the group. To save his followers from further persecution, Benedict left Subiaco and went to Monte Cassino. When arriving at a hill in Monte Cassino, Benedict found an ancient chapel dedicated to the god of Apollo. He promptly burned it down and erected his oratory of St. Martin. In this very place, he would create his first true community based upon his writings of the rule. Instead of setting up many houses like before, he created one community that all stayed at the same monastery. Not only was this a change in setup, 
but it was also a huge change in the work for his community. Subiaco was a retired valley away in the mountains. Cassino was on one of the great highways to the south of Italy. His monastery quickly became a center of influence in a district in which there was a large population. It is here that one of the most notable characteristics associated with Benedictines is shown. The fact that members take up any work which is adapted to their specific circumstances. Unfortunately, Gregory's narrative does not leave us with much information about the life and practices of Benedict after his establishment of Monte Cassino. One of the last dates we have for certain was 543, when Benedict was visited by Totila, king of the Goths, in which Benedict prophesied, Much wickedness do you daily commit, and many sins have you done. Now at length give over your sinful life. Into the city of Rome shall you enter, and over the sea shall you pass. Nine years shall you reign, and in the tenth shall you leave this mortal life. He was frightened by these words, and vowed never to be as cruel as he had before. This, however, was not enough, as in the tenth year of his reign, he lost his kingdom together with his life. Although this is the last date that we know for certain, we also know that he met with Scholastica three days before her death. Benedict was asked to stay by Scholastica, but he refused as he did not want to leave his abbey over the night. She would not be denied, though, as after joining her hands with Benedict, she prayed, and it is said that such a tempest of lightning and thundering occurred that none could even stick their head out the door. Not long after arriving back, Benedict received a vision in which he came as near to seeing God as is possible for a man in this life. There's a debate on what exactly this meant, but Pope Urban VIII said, The saint merited, while still in the mortal life, to see God himself, and in God all that is below him. If he did not see the light, he saw the light which is in the Creator. After this vision, he warned those living close to him, and those far off, that he was about to die. Six days later, after receiving the body and blood of Christ and having his weak body held up between the hands of his disciples, he stood with his own hands lifted up to heaven. And as he was in that manner praying, he gave his spirit up to heaven. After this, he was buried in the same grave as his sister. Although the mortal life of St. Benedict ended that day, the legacy he left has lived on for over 1,500 years. And the role of St. Benedict was the leading resource in the growth of Western monasticism. The creation of the Order of St. Benedict, and also the women's branch, founded by his sister Scholastica, has impacted the growth and understanding of Christianity over the last 15 centuries. During the first five centuries following the death of Benedict, the monasteries multiplied both in size and in wealth. It is said that they were even the chief repositories of learning and literature in Western Europe for some time. From then till now, the movement would rise and fall in popularity over the centuries. But the role and legacy of St. Benedict live on today and can help us better understand the rise of Western monasticism and the importance of bringing community together with order. If you liked that video about St. Benedict of Nursia, please feel free to give us a like below and hit the subscribe button for weekly videos every Saturday. For more information and for further research, hit the drop down button below our video to see the description with all of our resources listed. With that being said, thanks, and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.